let's start. Thank you for coming. This is a workshop for practical mobile app attacks by example. So we're going to see like a lot of attacks that we have seen in practice and how you could defend against them, how to fix them. And we will also have like some exercises, right? So we'll be able to see a lot of uh, cool attacks and we will also have like some cool case studies during the workshop. So let's get started. You will have access to all these for free forever. So I'm also recording the, the talk, maybe the organizers are as well. So one way or the other, the recording is up already from the previous time. Now in that session, there was a lot less time than here. So here we can we have more time to explain things in a little bit more depth. Yeah, so let's get started. So I'm just going to make this a little bit smaller. Okay, so I'm Abraham Aranguren. I'm CEO of 7A Security. So if you like this uh, workshop, you might like uh, some public pen test reports that are on the, up on the website. I have given training at Black Hat USA, Hacking the Box, OWASP, Global AppSec conferences, and many others. I have worked for many years at Cure53 and version one as a team lead and penetration and, and a penetration tester as well. I wrote a course for e-learn security a while back, practical web defense. I'm also the founder and leader of OWASP ETF, an OWASP flagship project. If you're interested in other presentations, you can find them in this link. And if we meet someday, we can talk about how all these certification madness happen. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, public report, but maybe these are a little bit more, let's say, uh, interesting in some ways, because for the Smart Sheriff rounds, this was a, an app that was mandated in South Korea. So if you are interested in mobile security, these two reports will give you a lot of uh, possible vulnerabilities and mistakes that you can make. And basically what happened was in South Korea, right? This is the good Korea, right? The one in the South is not the, the other one. So in this country, parents and children were forced to install an application so that the parent would control like what websites a child can visit, uh, during what times the, the child can use the, the phone and stuff like this. So the parent would control this from the parent app and then the child's phone would be enforcing all this with a child app, right? So we tested that twice and there were like a lot of security problems with this. So we gave a presentation about it. So you can watch it on YouTube and this, the slides are here as well. And these are the actual pentest reports. So this is relevant for mobile security. And then these are also relevant for mobile security, but they are more focused on privacy stuff, right? So these are like Chinese government applications about monitoring Muslim minorities in Xinjiang and stuff like this. And there's also a presentation about this on YouTube. You can like search for it. If you just search my name, you will probably find it. And there's like other pen reports. So just saying that all this is available for free and you can learn a lot by reading pen test reports. So this is all like public, right? So we are going to cover a lot of attacks that are unfortunately not in the public reports. So these are, have been like anonymized and stuff. But we will also have like some exercises that will be a bit more hands-on for like practice and stuff, right? So we're going to play a game about uh, find the vulnerability. Now, since some of these vulnerabilities I have already given at some conferences, I'm not going to give you access to the course, but you will keep access to this workshop for free forever, including the recording, including the vulnerable apps. And another thing is if you're interested in one of the other workshops we have for web security and for desktop application security, send me an email and I can give you access for free to those as well. Right, but just saying, let's try to guess the vulnerability. So let's start with denial of service attack, right? So the context was that library. So, you know, when a developer deploys a, a mobile application, typically there's going to be like some tracking library to learn like, hey, did the user open this page or this screen? What did they do there? And kind of stuff like this to improve the app, right? So this libraries like this. So in this case, the vulnerability was in a tracking library. So can somebody guess what this is doing? Any takers? I'm just checking the chat now. I'm checking the chat to see if somebody knows what this command does. Any guesses? Anyone? Seems like a listener, yes. And what is it doing? Mm 
let's hit scrub. I don't know what those flags are. Okay, so, okay, I'll tell you now. I know it's Kali Linux. Well, it, it doesn't have to be Kali, but it is in Kali, this, this tool, I think, SVD. Okay, so let me see. I'm just putting this here. Yeah, so basically, this is kind of Netcat, right? And the first command is just listening, it's just going to spawn the process again if it closes, right? Normally, in Net, if the process would stop, it would not listen again. So this dash or zero means that it has to wait zero seconds if the process falls or finishes until it starts again. C off means that encryption is off. And then NLDP, this is, these are all like standard Netcat flags. It's the same with SBD. It's kind of another clone of Netcat, but with encryption. So this is the, we are turning encryption off here. And we are listening on port 80. And then if anybody connects to point 80, we are going to reply with the output of the yes command, right? So the yes command, as it, its name implies, is just saying yes, 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 yes all the time, right? So it basically sends a lot of information, a lot of characters. So we can use this with DNS spoofing, right? So let's say the library was trying to query like a server, like some server.com, right? So with uh, man in the middle, we can DNS spoof some server.com to point to the attacker IP address or a server that the attacker controls. And then because the connection was a clear text HTTP, when the application connects, we are going to reply with a lot of information, right? So this is going to be a memory consumption Attack and this is uh, what the crash looked like, right? So I'm going to remove video stuff. Okay, so in here you can see this is the normal functioning of the application. So it's only using 50 megabytes of memory. And this is the crash, right? So you can see it's using almost one gigabyte of memory. So this is the problem, right? Now, how to fix this? Consider using another library, implement adequate exception handling, right? You should not only handle the exceptions you know are going to happen, you should also handle errors that are unexpected, right? Especially those. And then, so you need to have like a general exception handler for unexpected errors. This is a very common problem in a lot of apps, right? I handle the exceptions gracefully. So I'll be how to fix it. Now, some of the attacks that I'm going to cover today related to the SD card, right? So we have to explain a little bit why this is the what I how I can or like to call it the Wild West of Android, right? So the SD card is a location in Android where every application that has access to the SD card, it can yes, it can write its own files, it can read its own files, but it can also read and write files in the storage of another app on the SD card, right? So this results in a lot of security problems because if an application is saving sensitive information in the SD card, this means other apps on the phone can read this information, right? So this is the first problem. Then the second problem is if the phone is stolen, then what can happen is that the thief extracts the SD card and then this card is plugged into a computer. And then because typically there's no encryption, then the attacker can read everything on the SD card, right? So with this, just to keep things simple, if anything sensitive is saved on the SD card, this can be problematic and is probably a security problem, right? Because we have these two strong attack vectors, malicious application with ability to read and write these files on the SD card and a physical attacker kind of threat, which would be like a thief, for example, to your phone, right? So let's show a scenario of this, right? Uh, an application saving sensitive stuff on the SD card. So this was an application for whistleblowers. So basically this was for a country where, you know, these countries where the government is not very good and is kind of abusing people and stuff. So there was this app that was meant to provide the citizens with the ability to report all these human right violations and stuff like this, right? So the idea is very good to help people and let people report issues, but the implementation was very bad because they were saving this information with an XML format on the SD card, right? So you can imagine if you're in a country like that, then the government controls the police and then the police grab some guy that is running the app and has reported a lot of human right violations. So the police can just extract the SD card and read all the human rights violations that this guy reported. And maybe now this guy is sent to prison or something worse, right? 
So the implications sometimes of security bugs can reflect in the real world, right? So this is what the human right violation look like. So here we have device ID, phone number and all this. And then here it gets a little bit more sensitive, like first name, last name, age, gender, marital status, address, affiliation is victim. So all very useful information for, you know, an oppressive kind of government regime to attack people and stuff, right? So uh, sensitive stuff, right? Now, uh, another scenario, loading text files from the SD card, right? So can anybody tell me what the vulnerability is here? Let's see. I'm just going to check the chat. Any guesses about the problem here? Come on, somebody has to know. So it's an application. It's loading text files from the SD card and it's doing so with this JavaScript code here, right? Text files are being loaded from the SD card. Then the text file content is embedded into HTML. What can go wrong with that? It seems like we can do XSS. Yes, okay. So we have like a few good guesses there. And yes, that is the problem, right? So first we have the chapter, which is a text file is being loaded from the SD card. Then the next step here is there's like some function and stuff, you know, JavaScript is a little bit weird. It works with events and stuff. But here, eventually, we have this conversion, right? So it's reading the file and it's saving it into a page data variable. And then this page data variable is concatenated with the HTML of the page. So this leads to XSS, right? So here we have XSS. So with this, what can we do, right? Since we have XSS, we can try to exfiltrate data, right? Since, uh, sometimes this is possible. And we will have some exercises for Android and iOS about this in this workshop a little bit later. But sometimes you need to encode the payload, right? So in this case, this is creating a new XML CTP request. And then we get like in Android, you know, the location of the application and all of its files. So we can do data data and then the path of the application and get the web view database, for example. Then we send them this request. And if we can read the response in JavaScript, this means we can also forward this response to an attacker control server. So we can steal data from the phone, from the app to an attacker, right? So what happens with this? Like sometimes these single quotes, double quotes and stuff like this are going to break the payload, right? Especially if there's like some concatenation and the application is not very well written and stuff. So it is possible to encode these payloads using a hack vector, right? So hack vector is written, is a website by Garth Hayes, friend of mine. He's now working for Burp actually. So he put up this website and you can also use this from Burp itself. There's a plugin for Burp called hack vector and it does the same thing as the website. And basically you can put in there any payload, like in this case, this, and you can say evolve from chart code. So you have a menu. So this is, you don't have to remember all this, but basically you can specify uh, how you want to encode stuff. And then we have this way of executing JavaScript without any single quotes, double quotes, any other special characters, right? So we only have the parentheses, the dots and commas here, and that's all, right? So this is much more likely to execute without problems. This was required in this test in particular, but just hackvector.co.uk. You can use this from your browser. Very useful in mobile and web assessments. Super useful tool. You should use it. Right. So this is how the exploitation uh, look like. So we can read the SQLite database. Um, and yeah, now how, how do we fix this, right? So the first thing would be don't save sensitive information on the SD card, right? Avoid loading HTML from unsafe locations like the SD card. Um, output and code input before concatenating into HTML. So this chapter text file that was being read, it could be like changed. So all the content of the chapter, you know, all the HTML characters would be encoded into HTML and then they would not work. And then other things are like disabled JavaScript. And if you must use the SD card, then you can do these two things, right? So you can hash the cached files, right? Because sometimes applications save stuff on the SD card because there's more space. So you can like hash the cached files. So if the hash matches the hash, you can save it somewhere else outside of the SD card, like in the more protected storage of the app. 
and then if the hash doesn't match you will download the file again for example right and you will consider that file tampered so you're not going to read it and another thing you could do is encrypt the file as well right so you can keep the decryption key in some protected storage and then other apps will not be able to modify or read the file as easily right so these are some of mitigation ideas now let's look at copy paste text right so the scenario here was a crypto vault android application so can somebody tell me what this attack is put in the chat now any guesses about what this attack is What is this HTML doing? Accessing unencrypted credentials? Not really, no. Something else. Directory traversal? Yes, that is part of it. But there's another element of deception here. Does anybody... It's not really clickjacking. It's not really clickjacking, but it's kind of similar, right? There's a little bit of social engineering involved here. Anybody else? Just jump to look and then here, this is a deceptive, right? Because we are showing the user some text like here, just select all this text and copy paste it. But with CSS, we are telling the browser that this text cannot be selected. But you can, you can do like WebKit user select none with CSS. And then this text cannot be selected, right? Even though it's being displayed. And then with this other trickery here, we are putting like this text below this so that it is not seen with the an opacity of zero, right? And then here is the path traversal. So this is what the text that the user is really going to copy, right? So this is going to be a file overwrite using arbitrary file overwrite using a path traversal. The user sees the unselectable text, which is going to be this. But when the user copies this text, they are really copying something else, right? So how would this, did this look in practice? So it was something like this, right? So you would, you could imagine like a, the attacker has some website with fake instructions or something like this, right? And then the user is like copy pasting from there. So you have like some site and you copy this text and then you paste it. And this was password vault application, right? So this is a public report actually. So the, it was called the open keychain, I think. And it's basically similar to LastPass. So the functionality that was vulnerable for this was the export log. So if somebody pasted this in here, then you would really paste the path traversal. And then another thing is in mobile applications, because the screen is so small, there's always going to be some truncation. Right, so in this truncation, you don't really see the path traversal. The user has no way to know. There's some open keychain which kind of looks different than this, but maybe this would be unnoticeable. Maybe you could tamper this a little bit more, right? But the thing is, the user sees something, but they are really pasting something else, right? So then the application goes on and exports the log successfully. But this makes, of course, the app to crash because now the vault, the log has been exported as the vault database of the application so the application stops and then the vault is empty so the user has lost all the keys that they had in their vault right so yeah this was a cool attack so how to fix this right so make sure users have an option to see the entire pasted text and not just the beginning or the end right now this is difficult in mobile apps but there should be some option that the user can like uh, flick through a little bit um so yeah this is a common problem in mobile apps small user interface data rendering truncation equals excellent spoofing right so for social engineering attacks and stuff like this is really then if you just uh, expect a file from the user get the base name right so php has a function for this now depending on what the application is written if it's uh, written in java or if it's written uh, JavaScript, there's like React Native as well now. There's other platforms coming up as well. The name is escaping me now, but there's like uh, more things, right? But the thing is, 
you should only take the file name, right? And make sure it's not just like a full path that the user is giving you, but only get the file name from the path and then reject paths that contain uh, two dots together, right? So this is a better recommendation than looking for dot dot slash because if you just replace dot dot slash, then I can give you dot dot slash slash dot dot and then, you know, <laughs> and then when you remove the dot dot slash, you end up like the same way, right? So there's, uh, there's tricks like this, right? So reject paths that contain two dots together. Try to resolve the path before actually reading or writing the file and then verify that the path starts with the expected location, right? So if you're expecting to save the path on the SD card, then the path should start like that after resolving it, right? And then another very important thing is to concatenate the expected extension to the end of the final URL. Right, so if the attacker is giving you a file name and you are using these to save stuff on the file system, which I don't recommend, but let's say you have to do this for some reason, if you at least put the, the extension at the end, the extension that you expect, for example, in this case, it would be .log, then that automatically restricts the attacker to only be able to write uh, .log files. So this is going to make it a, a lot more difficult to overwrite, for example, a database or something like that, right? So they would be limited to only overwriting these type of files, even if the traversal and everything else was still in place, right? So this is a very good application idea. Now let's talk about spoofing attacks, right? So we can also, so we showed you can copy something and paste something else, right? So now we're going to show one URL, but then when the user clicks, they really go somewhere else, right? So you can achieve this sometimes with a Unicode a right to left and red, a left to right characters. So you would send a link, for example, like this, right, with mock.eagle.org, and then the victim really sees grow.live.com, but then when they click on this link, they really go to this other domain, right? So this is a useful attack against email applications, chat applications, anything that is going to turn a domain into a link. Sometimes adding these characters can result in, in problems, right? Now, if there's proper HTML encoding, this won't work because this should all be escaped because these are HTML entities, but uh, sometimes this is not the case and you can still pull this off, right? And so this has been used in the wild as well. You can read about that here. Now let's talk about attacking content providers, right? We have like in the course an entire lab about attacking content providers and things like this. So this is uh, a lot of fun with typically groceries used for this, right? On Android. So we have a browser application with a custom URL handler, right? So a browser application, let's say like Firefox or Google or something like this, right? The application was like allowed users to read news and the content provider actually allowed arbitrary applications installed on the phone to add fake news using the content provider, right? So you would specify like the string URL, like content, some vulnerable app, best articles, and then parse the URL and then put all the parameters, right? Like president disappears after entering police, whatever. And then you just insert this into the content provider, right? So you can insert uh, fake news, right? So how to fix this, right? Not to export content providers unless needed. And if you must export them, try to protect them with a permission that requires a signature. So only applications signed by the same developer will be able to call this provider, right? So now, when you talk about uh, mobile applications, right? Sometimes people think about, you know, like the typical stuff, you know, like URL handlers that we will cover today, XSS, SQL injection can happen sometimes as well, and things like this, right? And local leaks, but you would not expect a mobile app to have a server on the phone, right? But sometimes this happens, right? So this is a scenario that was found in a, in a test. So we had a Cordova iOS application. So it's basically, if you're not familiar, uh, Cordova is a platform that allows you to write mobile applications using JavaScript. So you have a web developer and they don't know too much about mobile uh, applications, but they can still write a mobile application in JavaScript without too much of a learning curve. And then the cool thing is you write this application in JavaScript and then it will work on both on Android and iOS, right? Sometimes like, a few tweaks are required. But in general, you, you only have to write the application once. You don't have to write it once in Java for Android and once in Swift for iOS. You can write it once in JavaScript for both, and then it works, right? So it's a cool platform for that. So it was a Cordova app, and it used a plugin 
that was running a local server on iOS, right? So that was uh, really interesting because like any application in the background could, could call this uh, background server. So you could have like uh, with an iframe, for example, if you have a browser application or with Safari, you could like invoke the server and then do a path traversal on it and get the Etsy password or other files from there, right? So it was really interesting. So this is how it looked in practice, right? Reading Etsy password and reading the files from the application itself, right? So we can access all that story. And then another thing that a malicious application could do would be like to the equivalent of, of this shell one liner, right? So we could like do a for loop on all the file locations that we know, and then we can do a wget of that and just download all the files, right? So with this, we could like download all the application, all the files that the application had, right? So how to fix this? Try try not to implement local servers unless needed, right? Because if you have a local server, now you have to worry about authentication, uh, not exposing it on the network, right? Like if the user is on Wi-Fi that other users cannot like connect to that server and do stuff. And malicious application inside, yeah, applications inside of the same phone that they cannot like talk to this uh, server and, and do stuff, right? Uh, so if needed, at least require authentication so that malicious applications cannot call it as I just showed and then validate the URL with appropriate access control and path traversal mitigation, right? So in this case, you could see we could traverse and get the Etsy password. So that should also be validated. So if you have a local server on a mobile app, then there's a lot of other stuff you need to worry about. So in general, it's not going to be worth it, right? So now we are going to approach the first exercise. Right, so in here, I'm just going to do it first myself and I'll do a live demo and then we'll give you like maybe 30 minutes or something so that you can try to follow the instructions, right? So can anybody tell me if cross-site request forgery exists in mobile apps, right? We know this exists on web applications. You get an administrator that is logged in, they visit the attacker website and then, you know, there's like a request sent from the attacker website and then you gain administrator access to the application, for example, right? You see in cross-site request forgery against the web app, but does cross-site request forgery exist against mobile apps? Can somebody answer that? Yes, no, any takers? I think yes, so we have one yes, two yeses. Yes, so you are correct. Cross-site request forgery exists in mobile apps and is going to be our first exercise in this workshop. Uh, this is going to be the hands-on part. So for this part, you are going to need access to the training portal. But this was all emailed to everybody today, so that should be fine. If somebody has problems, just email admin at 70security.com and then I'll, I'll take a look and try to help you out if there's any problem. So we're going to look at deep links attacks achieving user impersonation and deep link attacks to bypass authorization controls. So let's get started. So what is a deep link, right? So a deep link is a URI that can be used to navigate different parts of an application, right? So they can be available on both Android and iOS. Deep links can have custom schemes, right? So if you have an, Onion, an application called Onion Browser, you could have like an Onion Browser URL like that this says like, Onion browser, colon, slash, slash, and then whatever, right at the end. We will see some example of that later on. You could have a social media application that has a URL like this, right? Social media app and then homepage or whatever, right? So you can have the application and then profile, profile picture, right? So you have URLs like this. And with this, sometimes there's interesting stuff that can happen, right? So we are going to see a lot of cool attacks like this in this workshop, all from the real world. In Now we are going to look at a case in the Periscope Android application. I think uh, towards the end of the presentation, there's also like uh, an example from a real test that was really cool. Okay, so the first thing that the application needs to do is on the Android manifest for Android, right? So you can have deep links on iOS as well, but we will look at those a little bit later. You have the Android manifest, and then in here, you will see something like Android scheme, Android host, Android path prefix, right? So this is one way to do it. 
Now, a deep link does not necessarily have to be a custom URL. It could also be like a normal URL. And then when the application defines it, then when that URL is clicked from somewhere on the phone, Android kind of knows that this application opens those URLs and on iOS as well, right? So sometimes it can be with normal URLs and sometimes it can be with custom URLs, but we call both deep links and the attacks are the same regardless of the implementation, right? But this is one way to do it. And then another important thing, so this is going to define like the scheme, right? So some app, the host, right? In this case, get creds, right? And then the user is going to be the path prefix, right? So there can be a lot of path prefixes and a lot of possible combinations. So this is all important to know for custom URLs. But then another very important thing is this browsable thing, right? That you don't need browsable for a deep link but if you have browsable on Android, this means that from the browser, we can call this thing, right? So now the attacks are not only limited to malicious apps on the phone, they might also be exploitable from an attacker website, right? So if the user clicks on the attacker website, you can still reach this functionality, right? So yeah, this please you need to be logged in. So I sent you access to everybody. So if you didn't get the email, just check your spam folder. And if not, just email at admin at security.com and I'll, I'll just send you the invite again or something. But basically from the training portal, you can download the, the exact Periscope version that was vulnerable to this. So you, you need this version for to follow these instructions. Right, so I'm going to explain it now and then I'll do the demo. So you see it in practice and then we'll give you like 30 minutes to, to try to replicate. So. First, you need to create a Periscope account, right? So you just create account and then you can create it in a number of ways. It's just whatever you prefer. And then once the account is created, you should need to check the manifest, right? The Android manifest is going to tell you all the locations, all the deep links that the application defines, right? So if there was a cross-site request forgery in the flow of the application, right? So you need to check first which are the deep links that the application defines. So one tool to do this is APK tool. This will be the fastest. So I recommend you use this one if, if you have it around. So you do APK tool on and then D to decompile this version of Periscope, and then it will compile it we get a readable Android manifest, right? Because if you just unzip the APK, then the Android manifest will have like some binary stuff. It's not uh, as easily readable, so, but with APK tool, it's fine. So in here, you will see a lot of uh, exported activities. You will see intent filters, and you could focus more maybe on the browsable ones because they are a little bit more interesting for this aspect that I explained before they can be invoked from the browser itself, right? So in the case of Periscope, you will see like one of the schemes is PSCP, and then the Android host for it is user, and then this is the path prefix, right? So this is telling us already the format that it, it is PSCP and then colon slash slash user. So this is telling us how uh, the format works. And then we can start uh, verifying this, right? So one way would be to use an application that simulates a malicious application. So in this case, you can use Dibling Tester. Now you can get this from the portal as well. And when you use this application, you can specify their URI. And then when you click on go to URI, it's going to open the profile on Periscope for this guy, right? So we can do it like this, and this is fine. But here we have not performed any action yet. We're just opening the profile, right? So you can open the profile in other ways, right? You can open the profile with ADB, right? Um, I always like to use ADB when you give proof of concepts to your clients because all the developers, all Android developers will be familiar with it and will have ADB. Whereas Drosser, they won't have it, but still Drosser can be useful, right? So you can do ADB shell and then view and then go to the URL. And then this is the equivalent Drosser command to do the same thing, right? So you can run the scanner first, right? So Drosser has a scanner. It's not as perfect as you going through the Android manifest, but it will give you some results, right? So you can do run scanner, activity browsable, and then 
dash a of the identifier of the application in this case tv.periscope.android and this will give you like some possible urls right because to exploit deep links first you need to know which deep links are present in the application right so the browser will give us some guesses here from the scanner and it will also give us the names of the activities that appear to have deep links right now this is not perfect you you can do a much better job by looking at the android manifest but it's a starting point right so if you have no idea this can give you a, a valid point and there's nothing wrong with that now in here we are opening with the browser command right so we can do run app activity start and then action android intent action view and then you, we pass the data uri so data uri and then the actual uri and this will open uh, the user right so they are all different ways of doing the same thing and then from this url uh, if you open this on the phone we can also click on open user and this will be the equivalent of the same thing right and this happens because the activity is browsable right and we can open the browser with adb like this if, if you want right so this is just a quick trick so we have we have this right and when we click open user we are going to open the user so that's fine right so this is just to show that from a website or from a malicious application we can invoke this right here we didn't really do any crosshair request for me because we were just opening it opening the profile without making any changes but now uh, if we add to the same thing just follow in any of the approaches to adb to browser to the website right to the deep link tester uh, any way you want to do it the effect is going to be the same that we are going to follow this user without any user interaction right so a malicious application can send an intent to the periscope application and then it will automatically follow this guy even though the user didn't allow this at any point right so this could be useful to gain fake followers or whatever right so this is one way with the blink tester then with adb you can do it like this so adb command and then you do like the same thing and then at the end you add follow right and then with browser you can do it the same way right so in all cases this will result in follow and then here if you do periscope crosshair request for three demo it's going to follow this guy right so yeah and this is the html of that website on the proof of concept so we have open user and then the periscope uh, crosshair request forgery demo is going to be with a follow here right so yeah this is for ease of access and yeah how to fix this um in general what you want is like some kind of user interaction right so from a developer perspective when you're trying to fix this you need you need to have some prompt or some message that is going to ask the user hey do you really want to do this right and then the user says yes or no and then the action happens right so it should not happen directly which is the problem here we have cross request forgery because there's no confirmation message for the user so a malicious application or a malicious website when the user clicks on a certain thing can follow arbitrary users in periscope without any user confirmation right so are you sure you would like to follow person x right Which could be like a message to solve this right so with this let me share my other screen i think i'm going to share how do we do this because i'm going to share a couple of things so i'm just going to share the entire screen I'm just going to start here with the manifest. You can see this, right? Check the chat. Can you see my screen? Awesome. And you can see this as well, right? You can see the Android. Okay, cool. So this is the Android application. I already have Periscope. I already logged in, right? so the first thing would be to decompile this right so to compile this with apk tool right i have already done that you have the command on the slide and then you look at the android manifest and here you can look for browsable for example and this is going to give you some android schemes right so we have browsable this activity is also browsable this is the scheme it has a host of open this is another browsable activity now here we have a different thing, right? So this is what I told you. It does not necessarily have to be a custom URL. It can be HTTP or HTTPS, right? There can be like other ways in which deep links are defined. But typically the browsable ones are the most important. And in this case, 
we are interested, I think, on this one, right? So we want this Android team and the user, but all these attacks that I'm going to show, they work the same for other combinations that you can see here, right? But this is the way you would typically go about it, right? So this would be a way to do that. And then now, as you can see, let me see if I go to Drosser, right? And I start the activity, right? And I have the action view, and then I'm giving this URL, right? To open this user. Now, if I switch to the phone, you can see that this opened this guy, right? But we are not following him, okay? Now, if I go back and I add here follow, and I go back to this, you can see now I'm following him, right? Now you need to, now I'm going to unfollow him again. You need to click on something else so that the user is not being displayed for this to work, right? So this would be the browser way to do it, right? So I clicked on unfollow, so I'm not following him anymore. And now we can do the same thing with ADB, right? So we can do ADB shell. And now I hit enter on this. And now if I go here, you can see I'm not following him. Now you have to click something so that this hides. And then if I add here, follow, and I go back to here, you can see I'm following him again, right? Now I'm going to unfollow, right? So I'm not following him. Now I'm going to click here. And then the other way to do it is from the browser, right? So if I can open the user, for example, right? So this is the way to do it. Like just opening the user, you can see I'm not following him. And then you can also follow him directly, right? So a click on the Android browser is going to lead to an arbitrary follow of a person on Periscope, right? Without any additional verification, right? So this is what that looks like. Yeah, that's it for this demo. So now what we can do is I'll give you maybe half an hour or something, or maybe if you want to, if you finish quicker, you let me know. And then we continue to the next exercise, which is going to be deep links against iOS. But yeah, this is pretty much how this works. Well, let's get started. Any questions so far? Does everybody have access? If somebody does not have access, just an email to admin at 70security.com and I'll take a look now to all emails if somebody has trouble with access. But the exercise for this starts with the case study of Periscope. So when you download the slides, you can see here case study, Periscope. So start from this slide and try to follow the slides. And now hopefully that I've done the demo, it will make more sense. I see no questions so far. And I'll check now the email if somebody has access to problems, right? And yeah, and if you were not on the list of attendance I was given or something, just send an email to admin at 70security.com and I'll send you an invite for the workshop. Let's have a little break or maybe, yeah, we have four hours. I think 30 minutes can be good or maybe we can do a little bit less, but yeah, let's see where we are, right? If you want me to move on earlier, just say so in the chat. And I'm setting now a timer here for minutes. I see no questions in the chat. And now I'm going to check email and see if there's anybody with access problems, right? But you start this exercise from here. No questions about Periscope and the deep links on Android? Okay, good. So now let's talk about deep links on iOS. So we have deep link attacks to make phone calls, right? Because this is another interesting attack vector against mobile apps is to actually make the app make a phone call to a premium number, for example, and then you can monetize the attack, right? So this is useful for malicious attackers to make you to turn a vulnerability into money, right? This workshop, the exercises that we're doing are kind of abbreviated versions of some sections of the apps that we have in the mobile course, right? So yeah, you have like a bit of an idea about what we cover, right? So for this part, we need a dumb, vulnerable, insecure app version two, right? You can get it from the, from the training portal. You can also get it or read more about it on the official website. But yeah, that's the one that we are going to use now. 
So there's a couple of ways to go about this, right? So you could do, uh, if you decompile the app, you can look at the info P list and then the custom URLs uh, will be there, right? So this is how this would look like. Now it is possible that instead of seeing these, you get like a lot of uh, binary garbage. And this is because the plist format can be sometimes open as uh, XML, but other times it's going to be more kind of, you need uh, a Mac or uh, we will show another trick today in the demo uh, using Filza, for example. So from the phone directly, we can read a plist file without having a Mac, for example, right? But basically you the, you need to do, you need to look at the info plist. So when we checked Android, we checked the Android manifest. So the equivalent on iOS is the info plist file, right? So in here, a lot of the things like, for example, URL handlers, you will see them defined on the info plist. Uh, now, another way to check for URL handlers, if you have a Mac and you have Xcode installed, Xcode will only run if you have a Mac, in fact, right? So if you don't have a Mac, you cannot run Xcode, right? So this is a tool that only works on Macs. This is one of the reasons why you should consider having a Mac because sometimes it can be useful for some iOS testing and stuff. But essentially, if you have a Mac and you have the source code of the app, you would click on the app. So in this case, Dumbler and Secure App uh, version 2, and then you will go to Info. And then if you scroll down on URL types, you will see here URL schemes, Dumb Vulnerable, Insecure App, Dumb Vulnerable, Insecure App Stream, right? So you have here the two URL schemes, and this would be another way to do it. Um, and then basically, what this means is that we have these two URL handlers, right? Dumb Vulnerable Insecure App Swift and Dumb Vulnerable Insecure App. So both will be opened by this app. And then the next thing we need to do is to figure out if there's any code in the app delegate, right? So traditionally, iOS applications were written, most of them, in Objective-C. So this would be appdelegate.m if it is written in Objective-C. Now, nowadays, most iOS applications are written in Swift. So this will be appdelegate.swift and written in Swift language, which is completely different. But you always are looking for this file, right? Appdelegate.something. So in this case, we're looking for the Swift file. And so you can do a find and then you will see the file. And then when you open it, you can check how the URL is being processed, right? So before somebody in the chat was asking, like, how do I know on the Periscope thing that it is followed that I need to add for the Corsair request forgery to work, right? And you know those things by looking at the code, right? It is the code that is going to tell you most of the time that when follow is added, then it's going to follow the user, right? So in this case, we have the app delegate here, and this is the function handling when the application is being opened with the URL, right? So we have application, UI application, open URL. So this is the URL parameter. And then very interesting is what happens with that URL, right? So in this case, we have the URL and then the components are split by phone call number. And then it takes, so this is going to be split into, into two chunks, right? So whatever comes before in the URL and whatever comes after in the URL of this placeholder in the middle, so the zero, which would be the first chunk is being ignored, and the one, which presumably comes after, right, is checking this and is checking that it is an integer number. So it is a, if it is an integer number, then it, it considers that the URL is valid, and then it will try to ring that phone number, right? So this is how the processing works here, not how that looks. So to find and explore URL handlers, this is the code as well. And so this would be one way to check it, right? Another way would be using Xcode. So if you're using Xcode, uh, you can confirm if the affected snippet um, by navigating to the appdelegate.swift file and then reviewing the URL open implementation, right? So in this case, you would go to Dumb Vulnerable Secure version two, and then you expand this, you click on appdelegate.swift, and then inside of this, you will see the source code and you have function application, and this is the split of the URL string by phone call number. And then here we have the int check, right? So it is casting to integer, and then it's checking that the cast to integer was correct. And if it is correct, so it is different than nil, 
then it assumes everything is fine and it will try to call the number. Right? So this is how you would find the vulnerability at the third code level. We have two example URLs with which we can make the iOS application to call a phone, right? So you can use a jailbroken phone or if you don't have one, actually you don't need one for, for this. You will still need to somehow install the vulnerable and secure app on the phone, but otherwise you don't need the phone to be jailbroken to do this part about testing the URL handlers. Now, if you click on this link on Safari, on the iOS device, from here you will have two links that when clicked will try to call the number, right? Yeah, you can also like take the HTML from here and host it on your own server, but that will take more time. So this is easier for everybody. So this is how the HTML looks like, right? So we have an href and then we have down vulnerable insecure app Swift and down vulnerable insecure app. And these are the URLs for both. So it's basically just a link and then we have the phone number at the end. And then when each, any of these links are being clicked, this will open on the phone and it will call, it will call that, right? So you will see something like this, uh, open in the vulnerable app, and then you click on open and then it tries to call the number, right? So this is a way to monetize deep links by making mobile app call a phone, right? So that is how you would do that. And yes, just to reemphasize that ringing premium numbers, it can be a serious issue in the mobile environment, right? We will also see an attack later on about calling numbers, calling premium numbers. So with this, let's get started, right? So I have here the HTML, right? So this is, when you go to this link, you will see this, right? And this is how the HTML looks like. But what we really need to do, can you see the iOS device? Yes, okay, good. This is the vulnerable and secure app, right? And in this case, because we are attacking the URL handler, we are actually don't have to do anything on the app itself. But if I open Safari, we can see here at the top that I have the two links, right? So if I tap on the first one, and I now go here to open, we get the success calling this number ring ring, right? So it is calling this premium number. And if I do it using the second one and I hit open, we also get the same thing, right? So here I hit OK. And if I hit again, we can see that the success message pops up again, right? So now let's give for this one, maybe, I don't know, 15 minutes. How does that sound? Sounds good? Now that more or less everybody has access and stuff. And if you didn't have time to finish the previous exercise, then you can do the previous exercise if you don't have time before, if you don't have an iOS device. And if not, you can start this one here, right? So let's just like get down vulnerable to get up version two, and then from here you can start with the slides, try to follow the instructions. Yeah, let's give like a few minutes for you to get your hands dirty on this, and maybe you have some questions afterwards. Sounds good? Are you liking this so far? Awesome. Okay, so 15 minutes and then we continue with more attacks and exercises. During the demo, I forgot to show you that one application that you can use to look at the info P list is Filza, right? So with Filza, you can just browse to where the application is on the phone, right? So you go to private var, for this you would need the phone to be jailbroken, right? Private var, containers, bundle, application, and then you try to find the app, right? So in this case, it's down vulnerable, insecure app version two. So I tap on this, and now I tap on the app itself. And here you would look at the info P list, which is here. Right? And then it lets you 
view the info p list in a format that is actually readable, right? So in this case, we are looking for URL types. Let me hide this. So you can see that we have bundle URL types, and then we have this item, and then we tap on this, and then bundle URL schemes. And now here we have that these are the URL schemes for this app, done vulnerable in secure app and done vulnerable Swift. Now, um, the reason why Filsa is useful to let you see Filsa files like this is that if I try to do the same on the phone itself, then it will show like garbage, right? Here, I could take the phone. No. Yes, of course. And then by default, when you jailbreak, the password is Alpine, and then I can go to var mobile. Uh, let's see. Containers. No. Private bar. Mobile. Containers. No. Let So bar containers. Our containers bundle application, and then here we are faced with this problem that you don't know which ID corresponds to which app. So you can get around this to filter, which will tell you, right? You go to bundle application, and then you can scroll down. So this will be one way to do it. So in here you can see that it is the one starting with two E8. Right? So this will be one way, and another way would be that you do find from this directory and then just do some grab secure app and this will give you some path right so the thing is so if i open this directory right in here if i open or if i do cat info pilot you can see that we cannot read this as well as from Filsa, right? Because Filsa can can read these files natively, right? So in here we open the info list and we can read it, we can expand and, and so on. So as I said, right? So this is one section that I realized later that I didn't cover in the demo. And it would be part of doing an, an iOS app analysis, right? So you always need to check the info list. Okay, so with this, I think we can move on. So let's continue. Right, so now let's we will see a few more interesting aspects and then we will move back to, to a couple of exercises, right? So let's take a look at sexy URI scheme attacks, right? So we have a browser application with a custom URL handler, so very similar to these exercises that we did, right? Does anybody see a problem with this? Does anybody see a problem with this code? Any takers? Any guesses? Nobody? But you can hear me, right? <laughs> can you hear me? 
and see the slides. Okay. This quit store, kind of, yes. So then we have here a URL handler and we have a check. So this will make, so BB is the one that was the closest here. So you can see here the check, right? This is using Objective C. And so it is at the Onion browser, is the application, right? It's a browser. So it can navigate to an attacker control page, right? So the page could have an image like this, for example, Onion browser column for squid. And then this would automatically close the app, right? Because the app had a check like this. If the request, the URL, and then it tries to get the location, if it contains Foursquid somewhere, right? If it is different than not found, which means if it is found, then it will close the application, right? So with this, you can make the application do things depending on what the URL handler does by a page that is attacker controlled, right? So this is what the problem was. And how to fix this? At a minimum, prompt the user before quitting. If possible, eliminate force quit functionality. Implement a separate screen flow for the help area, which websites cannot invoke, right? So the problem here is the application is exposing functions like uh, the option to close itself without any kind of restriction. So other applications could call this uh, other pages that the application is navigating to could, could interact with that. So that is the problem, right? And then in general, consider universal links as custom URLs can be hijacked and are insecure. Okay, so this is specific to iOS. So in iOS, if you have a custom URL, like in this case, Onion Browser or something, any application can register that URL, right? So this is considered insecure. And for that, iOS defines a mechanism that is this math safer that called uh, universal links, right? So universal link is going to be like HTTPS something, and then the domain has to have like some validation and stuff that iOS will check. And this is going to be uh, much safer because it is not possible to hijack without owning the domain as well or something. So let's take a look at sexy logic bugs, right? Because logic bugs, are interesting because they are often subtle issues, right? So for example, a typical case would be like you make a payment on a website and it's on a negative amount. So am I getting paid for this item, right? So this would be a typical example. Uh, so they are often subtle issues like that, just a sign in an amount uh, leading to a problem. And they are sometimes hard to find. and They are almost always missed by automated tools, right? An automated tool is, is almost never going to find a logic bug. A logic bug typically requires the tester to understand what the application is doing and things that a silly automated tool can, can never do, right? So let's take a look at an example like this, right? So this was an application and the application intends to have JavaScript disabled by default. So when you open the application, you have the menu, you see enable JavaScript, it's disabled. And this is the code to check if it's enabled or not. So can you see, can anybody see the problem with that? Any takers? Any guesses about what could go wrong with that way of checking things? Null equals true, uh, yes. So basically, yes, so you are correct, Nels. So basically what happened is getting the preferences, getting a boolean for, uh, from the preferences for the JavaScript preference, if it's set to true or not. So it tries to get the string, but then if the string cannot be retrieved, then it will return true. So what happened was the preferences were not on the preferences file. And therefore, with this code, this preference, even though it was being shown as disabled on the user interface, it was enabled, right? Because because of this code that is defaulting to true, right? So we could have like a proof of concept like this, trying to read a lot of stuff from JavaScript, and this is like 
screenshot about about create disabling not working, right? So this was a proof of concept showing that. So how to fix this? First of all, ensure the preferences are set in the preference file, right? This this was the problem because it was not set on the preference file. It was failing, and then uh, another thing is try to default to the most secure setting instead, right? So in this case, it's defaulting to the insecure setting to enable JavaScript, so it should be set to false instead, right? Now let's look at another scenario for URL validation, right? Any guesses about what is wrong with this? Can anybody see a problem with that? have here ignore SSL errors no here we have ignore SSL errors yes some conditions can somebody see anything wrong with this this is a very common problem in a lot of applications no matter if they are web applications or desktop applications or mobile applications and this is a problem that comes up a lot so it's important that you get familiar when you're doing a code review to find this kind of problem because it happens a lot but i'll give you now a, a few more hints no nobody nobody sees the problem give you 10 more seconds and since somebody can notice something weird there When it debug mode, it ignores SSL. Well, the debug is only for this, right? So this is a little bit distracting. This is actually not important for location equal equals zero. Well, this is checking that the URL starts with HTTPS. So this, this part is actually okay. But this is not really the problem. The problem is here, right? Because what happens is with Onion servers, you cannot check you cannot really check the dssl certificate because that works in kind of a different way right it's an onion server it's not like a typical https url so it's checking if there's dot onion somewhere and this is different than not found which means it's found right so well, it's a little bit backwards but i mean over complicated right because it's basically saying if dot onion is found right so this is what this is saying but the problem is is this checking this on the host so this part is good right is using the url parsing from ios so that is good it's not trying to parse with a home role uh, mechanism so this part is good but the problem is is checking dot onion anywhere on the stream right so this would be the equivalent of in php maybe string pause or string string in c you have string string as well or string comp String, string CMP, right, in C, um, in Java or other languages, you will see something like it, if it includes this string or if it contains this string, right? So this is the problem, right? It's checking that dot .onion is anywhere on the screen, on the string itself. So since it can be anywhere on the string, we can do something like this. We can create a subdomain called paypal.com.onion dot seven dot org and then we made it point to a google ip right so the ssl certificate is completely invalid and if you look at this from from a normal browser you are going to get warnings right so a normal browser will not let you navigate to that but if you navigate it to this through the onion browser you will get no no warnings because of that code that we saw before Right, because it thinks that it's an, an onion server, so it doesn't have to check the SSL certificate, but it's really not, right? Because it has more stuff afterwards, and it is not checking that it ends in dot onion. The host part of the URL ends in dot onion. It's checking that dot onion is anywhere, right? So we can have it here. We could have like basic authentication, like we could do user colon and then uh, dot onion as the password and then add whatever server i want.com that will be another possibility right so this is a very 
typical problem, very common problem against all applications. Uh, the developers have some check like it includes, it contains, it's string string or uh, any other function like that, that is just checking for the presence of the string anywhere, right? Where it sh really should be checking that it is at the start, where it is at the end, right? And it should not be anywhere else on the string, it should be actually on that part, right? So this was the problem, right? And this is report is public for the Onion browser, so you can read more about it there. But it's a very common problem. It's important that you, if you do security reviews or if you're a developer trying to secure applications, that you get familiar with this security anti-pattern because it happens a lot, right? So to fix this properly, in this case, what the application really should be doing is to check that the host name ends with .onion. Right, to skip SSL validation and then verify that the dot onion domain is actually running an onion server it's not just a random server like that right so those would be the two things to check right now let's take a look at money in the middle app in this case we had a secure messenger app and it is quite common for applications that have some sort of chat functionality to use the XMPP protocol right it's basically instead of using HTTP it's just sending messages with XMPP, which is basically sending the message over an XML kind of protocol, right? So in this, when you're trying to manage in the middle XMPP, one trick that you can try is first, the client connects to the server. You can say as the eagle server that you are, that the only mechanism available to authenticate is plain, right? So this is going to force the application to send the credentials in clear text if it is not implemented correctly, right? It should really notice this and not do it, but because we do not provide any other authentication mechanism other than plain, then the application is sending us the credentials in clear text. And in this case, this is uh, base64 encoded, so we can base64 decode it and it will decode, uh, in this case, it decode to, to this, right? So this is a way this is a very cool trick that you can try not only against XMPP, but for mail applications, you can try this on pop 3 IMAP, and other protocols like that. Sometimes if you specify that the only mechanism is plain text, this can give you the credentials, right? So how to fix this for TLS connections, right? And so in this case, the issue is that XMPP starts using clear text. And then it switches with a start TLS command to, to a secure connection. So because it starts with clear text, there's more potential for an attacker to do stuff like this, right? So first use TLS and TLS will provide integrity and confidentiality to all the XMPP traffic, right? So wrap all the XMPP traffic over TLS. And then uh, the other thing is refuse to connect if there's no TLS available, and then refuse to connect if the credentials, if only plain authentication mechanism is allowed, right? Now let's take a look at an update check mechanism, right? Because another very important thing to check when you're testing a mobile app is see if there's some sort of update check, and if so, that the update check is being done correctly, right? So does anybody see a problem with this? So the application is checking for updates like this, right? Some server, update with JSON. Any problems with this request to see if there's an update available? Any guesses? Anybody? This one is very easy, come on. Plain text HTTP, exactly. HTTP instead of HTTP. So this means that if the user is on public Wi-Fi and there's no guest isolation, then any kind of arbitrary kid with, you know, with just the ability to mine in the middle of clear text HTTP can change this, right? And in this case, now we go back to the calling of premium numbers, right? So in this case, you can give like a, a bad update, but the bad update URL is really a phone number, right? So in this case, what happened was that uh, the application would show something like this to the user there's a new version of the name of the application and then when you click on update it starts calling the premium number 
right? So this was a pretty cool attack and is something that you can sometimes do if the update check is being done insecurely or here it is being done. Right? So how to fix this? Take updates over LS, consider pinning to protect SSL communications against uh, higher profile attackers like governments and some governments and companies have the ability to craft a certificate for Google or Facebook, for example. So with pinning, you can protect yourself from that. You can Google um, the OWASP pinning cheat sheet and it, it shows like a lot of tips about setting that up. And it has examples for Android and iOS. Then check the update URL is really a URL and not a phone number, right? Important. Verify that the update URL matches some trusted domains. And then sign and verify the signature on update checks and sign and verify the signature of updates, right? So these are all important considerations when you are implementing an update. Now, another interesting scenario that we saw in another app is when the app is retrieving a zip file and then unzipping it on the phone, right? So, and anybody see a problem with this? Any guesses about what is wrong here? Nobody? Okay, so maybe you are not very familiar with app transport security, but basically since iOS 9, iOS restricts with this app transport security policy, it restricts clear text HTTP uh, connections, right? So it does not let an application make any clear text HTTP connection unless the application defines some exception domain where this is allowed. So this is the exception that we can see here. So we have NSAP transport security. We have a list of exception domains. In this case, it was uh, an Amazon S3. And then here we can see that the application, for some reason, allows clear text HTTP connections to this to, uh, to this Amazon S3, uh, right? So in this case, what happened was that the application was retrieving a zip file from Amazon like this using a clear text HTTP URL. So an attacker with man in the middle can replace the zip file with something else. And then when the application extracts this zip file, um, this allows the attacker to overwrite the arbitrary app files, right? So we can do a lot of attacks with this. You can do a zip bomb. You can try to over the sensitive files that the application has, like some database or something, and then the application will crash. And there's like a lot of things like this that you can try, right? So. How to fix this? Avoid weakening APS, so you should not have any exceptions. Actually, if you have exceptions, this could trigger an App Store review by Apple, and your application could be kicked out of the store. So that's another reason why you should be careful with weakening app transport security, right? So this is abbreviated as ATS on iOS. And then use dependencies that you secure TLS communications, of course. So in this case, it was not the application itself that was doing this request, it was one of the packages that the application was using, right? Now let's take a look at user dialog for SSL warnings. Right? Because sometimes the application gets like some invalid SSL certificate, and then the user is given the option either to click through it or not and stuff like this, right? So in this case, this is how the application try to handle this, right? So first we have some certificate checks and here we have catch certificate exception and if there's a certificate exception so something is wrong with with the ssl then we're going to ask the user right so the user gets a dialogue like this and then they can accept a known certificate always or once or abort or not trusting it right so then to process the answer of the user the application registered a broadcast receiver like this, so it registers a broadcast receiver on the fly. So this is another reason why you should not rely on the Android manifest alone, because sometimes the applications can register a receiver on the code itself. So you should always try to look at the code for vulnerabilities and not just the Android manifest, even though the Android manifest is a great start, of course. 
But in this case, you can see that in the Android manifest, you would have missed this completely, right? Because this was in the code. So it registers a receiver, and then it tries to get the, the answer from the user. So it starts some activity, it waits for the choice. And then at the end of the whole thing, once we get the answer from the user, we unregister the receiver. And this is the actual processing of the answer, right? So it gets an intent, it gets a decision, it gets the choice. And then if all is okay, like the user, for example, clicks on accept always, right? In this, in this dialog, click here on always, then it will store the third, right? So can anybody uh, see a problem with this approach that I just described? Any guesses about what is wrong? Any takers? Do you know what a broadcast receiver is? We are not showing the code. Well, I was showing the code before. Uh, there's a lot of code to show. Uh, but the main thing is here, right? The broadcast receiver. So a broadcast receiver is going to receive uh, intents, not just from the app itself, but from any app on the phone, right? So this is, this is what the problem is, right? So we could basically send a broadcast as a malicious application. We can simulate this with ADB shell. We can send a broadcast intent, and then the applications that are listening to the broadcast will take it with a given decision and a given choice so basically we can spoof the answer from the user because the application is not it just has a broadcast receiver open to all applications in the phone whereas it's really intended to only process the answer from the same application right so this is what the problem was so how to fix this now instead of using a broadcast receiver you could try to use a local broadcast manager so if, with this approach, this will only listen to broadcast messages from the app itself and not from any other app on the phone. So this alone would be enough. Then if you must use the broadcast receiver, you could protect it with a permission. So only applications signed with the same developer certificate will be able to call this broadcast receiver. And then if you must use the broadcast receiver, you could and not protect it with any permission, you could consider making the decision ID an unpredictable random token instead of a sequential ID. So this way, even though the whole thing is exposed and malicious apps could call it, since the random token will not be guessed by a random application, then this will also protect from this, right? So these are some ways in which you could try to mitigate that. Now let's move on to man in the middle of XMPP, right? So we talked a little bit about this before. So if you're trying to man in the middle XMPP, one thing that you could do is to set up Prosody, right? So Prosody is an XMPP server that you can use to get started. By default, it will run with its own self-signed certificate. This is the location of the configuration file and here you can configure a multiple virtual hosts, so you can configure a virtual host for Gmail, Jabber, and for chat, Facebook.com. So it will all be there. So you could DNS spoof, right? So whenever the application tries to connect to the XMPP server, it's going to go to your attacker server where you have this fake XMPP server. And because by default, uh, Prosody uses a self signed certificate, if you can get the application to connect and, and try to log in and stuff, then this means that the application is not validating the certificate, right? So in our case, in one of the tests, this work with the default self-signed certificate, right? So this is just a quick way for you to test this kind of stuff. Now let's look at more clear text HTTP communications on Android. So we have an app, it gets an XML file from the server, and then it saves this file from the file name, right? So we have like to do, download file name, is retrieved from the XML here, and the contents are retrieved from the XML. And then here's some code creating a new file 
space these two parameters provided in the XML. So any guesses about what is wrong with that? Does anybody know what is wrong with this? Nobody? Well, this is easy, right? It's the same thing as before. You had a hint in the slide before, clear text HTTP communications, right? So we have clear text HTTP here. So in this case, we could, well, this was the first, the first problem is that the XML file is retrieved over clear text HTTP. So on average, one in the middle attacker can change that. Then the attacker can host the XML file, host the XML file so they can change anything on the XML file. So it can modify the application to receive human rights violation reports for forever, right? In this case, because this was another whistleblower application, right? So we have the file name. And then this is the path traversal with the preferences. Now, since the attacker controls the XML file, they can also give you the MD5 for the integrity of the other XML file. And then the download URL is like attacker.com.com. So basically, in essence, what this does is when the application saves the file, it will try to save it with this file name, which has the path traversal. So this is overwriting the app preferences, right? So we have a forged uh, attacker control app preferences file that is configured so that the application will always send the, the request whenever it finds like some human right violation, it's going to send it to the attacker, right? Because uh, we modified the entire preferences file and the server URL is now attacker control. So this would be very useful for a malicious government, for example, to uh, read all the human rights violations and stuff, right? So this is how they look in practice in Logcat, right? Which is something you should always monitor when you're doing uh, tests on Android. First, we can see that MMTSD card, but then with the dot dot slash, we can get out of the SD card and go into the protected uh, private storage of the app, right? So other apps would normally not be able to access this, but with the path traversal, we can. So first it deletes the file and then it creates here the new preferences file and it copies over the attacker configuration. So this was pretty cool, right? Permanent man in the middle uh, via arbitrary file write. So this is the confirmation of Logcat. So how to fix this? Uh, validate the file name against a wide list of characters. So for example, only allow letters, numbers, and dots, right? And then very important on regex, sometimes developers forget uh, to restrict that it's the start and the finish on the string and everything in the middle should match what you want, right? So if you forget this or this, then the regex will work, but then it will be, you know, it will be possible to bypass it because there's no this restriction of the beginning and the end. Then uh, use TLS, it's free now, just let's encrypt, right? Consider pinning to protect from higher profile attackers. So this is the pinning cheat sheet that I mentioned before. And now, uh, we're going to do a couple more exercises about XSS attacks and data exfiltration on Android and iOS, right? So we're going to use XSS against the applications to steal data, right? So first, uh, let's, look at, let's take a look at Android, right? So we have web views, and now a web view is kind of a browser, right? So it has the same properties as a browser pretty much, so it has HTML, um, and then this HTML loads things, right? It typically has JavaScript. And then it is possible, depending on how the web view is configured, to read local files and uh, invoke uh, remote websites or send data to remote websites. So this is useful for data exfiltration. And then another possible problem is that native uh, Android functions can sometimes be accessed from web views with the help of JavaScript, right? So you could have a JavaScript interface, right? So this is something that it is possible sometimes. Now this is less common than before, but still it can happen. So we can have 
several scenarios here depending on how the web view is and what the actual bug is but we could have html injection right if we only have html injection this could still be useful for example we could show a fake login page that when the user enters the credentials it sends the credentials to an attacker right so this could be a good scenario now uh, with xss we can change the page we can invoke functionality from javascript and all more stuff and then if we have xss we can probably in some cases do also data exfiltration of local, local files right this is going to depend on the security context and the web view settings but sometimes it's possible and we're going to have a couple of cool exercises about this now we could have a possible user impersonation using cross -site request forgery uh, using xss depending on the application as well right so we got all possibilities but now this is the application that we're going to use for this exercise it's called android gold now the official version will not work for this we modified the original version so that it, it it is possible to exploit this type of attack right so this attack we have seen against uh, normal applications android gold was not super uh, useful for this kind of thing but we changed it so so it would be right so you need to get the one from the training portal so on the slides just click on this link and you should be able to get this right and then we need first because we are going to do data exfiltration we need to steal files from the vulnerable application so first we need to create some data files right so you need to go to your data storage on the android code right and then you go to share preferences and save some data there right so you go to your preferences part one the user, the password, and hit save. And then we can create a SQLite database. We go to SQLite, some users and password, and hit save. And then we have some files to steal, right? So we can check these by looking at the storage, right? So yeah, and you could, uh, if you have done this lab before, you might need to remove this file from the SD card as well, right? Depending on how far you got into it. So then we go to input validations and access and now third the typical way to go about this is first to add some html so we can add like hello with tags right and then we can see that hello is bigger so it is already interesting so this confirms we have html injection but we don't know if we have xss yet but for that we can use some fields like this image protection error alert one or script alert one so this Will give will will tell us if we have access or not. So we can see that we do. We can see that when we put these payloads, we get the alert, so it's working. Uh, and then the next step after we know we have access is okay. What kind of privileges is this likely to have, right? Or where is this being loaded from, right? So we can do an alert location, for example. And in this case, this tells us that in both cases, a file URL is being used, right? So this already should raise some eyebrows and excitement in people because this means the same origin policy is not going to be enforced, right? Now in Android, you also have to have some security settings enabled for this to work. But the fact that this is being loaded from file, this is already uh, promising, right? So you can try it like this and can see that so in internal storage we have an html file and then on external storage we have another html file right so you need to figure out the path right you need to know uh, which files to steal from the vulnerable app right so if you have a rooted phone then you can go into android gold, right so it's data data always and then sad a gold and then inside of here you will see that we have share preferences and then there's users xml and databases account so these are the two files we will try to steal and this is how you would go about finding them and then we can try to steal them with an access like this right so we can create a new xml http request get the xml file and then we send the request and then we alert it and then if when we alert it we can see the data in this file this means we can steal it right so you can use this and then in a real attack then this data would be sent to an attacker controlled website right so this is how we steal the users this is how we steal the database and this is how it looks in practice right so you have you have this and then you can see here that we're stealing the credentials 
and here we're still in the database, right? So we have all that. Now, another scenario is that if the app has SD card access, any SD card file can also be read, including SD card files for other apps. So a malicious application scenario applies, and then we could have XSS that way, right? So an application paint the, the HTML file on the SD card, and then we have XSS that way, right? So um, this is another scenario, but other things that we can try, right? So if you have grocery installed, you can try to get the, this file from there. Yeah, depending on the phone you have, if you try this on the phone, you can probably get this file as well, system at this Etsy and then custom.conf. So there's different files that you can get and they do not, do not necessarily have to belong to the application. They can be other files on the phone as long as the application has the rights to read it. Right. So using XSS, we can fill the data like that. So this is uh, an example with a real phone reading these two files, right? So in summary, with XSS, we can exfiltrate application data files from the vulnerable app, system files, as long as they have permissions uh, that allow other apps to read it, files from other apps, as long as they have permissions that allow this, and uh, any SD card file, right? So the location needs to be known, the victim app needs read access to the SD card. So methodology-wise, you're looking to answer the following questions, right? So can we run JavaScript? And if you get the alert, this is a yes. Under what context is JavaScript being executed? So this is why we do the alert location. So if we have a file URL, then that is good because this is a privileged context. This is not protected by the same origin policy, which means we can read local files, right? And then uh, the XSS data exfiltration, Android, right? Another important thing here is to try to uh, read the files, right? For this, you need to know the location of the file. So you need to do a little bit of research to figure this out, as we showed earlier. But we can uh, read these files, and this was also successful. So this means we can steal files from the application because it's useful. Now, the other scenario I mentioned, when an application loads files, HTML files from the SD card, then any app on the phone can change that HTML file, and then we get access without doing anything else, right? So we can change the SD card file, and then we can get access directly, right? So this is how could go about this, right? So you could do ADB shell, and then this is the, the output to find the, the HTML file, and then you would change this HTML file to put some JavaScript in here, and whenever this is being opened by the application, for JavaScript payload will fire, right? So you can do ADB pool of uh, this HTML file, and then we can change it, and then whenever the application is opened, uh, we will get this, right? So this is a payload that you could inject, right? So you try to get the user's HTML. And, and yeah, and then after the modification, you put the HTML back into the SD card. And then this will work, right? So you go to input validation. And then without clicking on anything else, this will pop up automatically because the XSS is firing. Right, so one way in which you can go about uh, to do this is you can upload the app to MobSF, right? The mobile security framework is very good automated tool for this. Um, and this will run some checks. It will also decompile the app for you and stuff. And then you can do an ls and then dash lt to sort by time as well. So this means that the most recent uh, directory would be on top on the if you're using Kali uh, root dot MobSF uploads, right? So I'll be there. And then you can upload locally, right? So you can create like some directory and then you can move uh, or copy the uploaded directory into a decompiled directory, right? And then you can grab for external storage and that will point you in the right direction about where these HTML files are. And you can see them there, right? So, yeah, I think because we still have two demos and a bit of presentation and stuff. Yeah, we will move on now to the demo shortly, but does anybody see a problem with this? Any issues with this code?
what is the problem with this? Right, we have external storage, display content, it gets the name variable, it sends it to A, then it does document dot write of A dot value. Is there any problem with this? Any takers? Does nobody see a problem with this? Can write arbitrary JavaScript into that function direct direct write from a variable that can be changed. You can overwrite any file. Well, you are, this is a document dot write. What it's doing it is saving the value of this a parameter in the HTML, right? So this is the XSS. It's really not writing any file. It is writing in the HTML of the page. So this is XSS basically, right? This is DOM XSS. It's a DOM XSS sync document dot write, right? So yeah, right into the DOM. This is the issue, right? It's writing into the DOM. So the attacker controls uh, this. So this is the actual XSS on the application. Okay, so with this, I think to the demo, yeah. So this is the vulnerability, the document of write. And now I think we will just go for the demo. Yeah, and another thing is you can then look for the name of the file to try to see if that points you into the files in the source code where this is, right? And this takes you to the access activity on Java. And here you can see why this works, right? So the views have JavaScript enabled. Now, the, another interesting thing is this application, I think, is written in Kotlin, right? But this actually is really translated into Java. So when you decompile the app, you don't get the Kotlin, you get the Java, right? So you can see it somewhere here. So you can see the first web view is enabling JavaScript. It allows universal access from file URLs. It allows file access from file URLs. And it allows file access, right? So it has all the insecure settings enabled, and this is why the data exfiltration works, right? Some of these settings were made secure by default uh, on Android after Android 4. Point something. But there's uh, some slides later on. So this is why it works, right? And then the other things that we can see here is that the URL is a file URL and then it's being loaded like this, right? In both cases. So we have that, right? So how to fix this? We try to apply as many of the following countermeasures as, as possible, right? So in general, try to favor a text view over a web view, right? So if you have a text view, then no access is possible by definition because it's only text. Sometimes this will do the job, so that it's not necessary to have a web view. And in those cases, a text view is better because it just eliminates the possibility of XSS. Then if you have to use a web view, try to disable as many settings as possible, right? Especially JavaScript, especially file access, like all those things should be disabled, right? So this is the same as in network security, right? They're all saying like, you should have as few ports open as possible. So with web views, uh, security settings is the same thing, right? So try to disable all the settings uh, possible and only have the minimum settings possible for the application to work. Then output encode user input prior to rendering it on any web view, then avoid DOM XSS things as much as possible, right? So if you have user input assigned to inner HTML, location, href, things like this, this can all lead to XSS, right? And instead you should use like text content and other things that will not result in XSS. Now, there's a lot more about this on the OWASP uh, XSS prevention cheat sheet, but hopefully this was enough for you to give you an overview. So now let's move on, right? So I have here the payloads already, right? So I'm going to copy the hello, right? So I just like this, if I can, copy, and then I go to Android. Right. First, you would need to go to insecure data storage, share preferences, and here you put like my username. And here you put my secret word or something like that, and you save this, right? You get that saved. Now, if I go back, 
everything. I click this, yes. So now I go back to SQLite, right? So this is the other option. And then I put here my secret SQLite user. And then I put here secret SQLite password. And I save this, right? So first thing is you install Android code and you need to have, so you need to have some data, right? So we have this, okay? And now we can move on in the actual exercise, right? Because we have data to steal, right? So now we can go to input validations, exercise. And if you have the modified version from the training portal, this will not be in the official Android code, right? We modified this app to reflect this kind of attack, right? So in here, I can paste the hello from before, right? And to save a little bit of time, I can load another payload. So we can do twice, two payloads each time. So first we are going to prove that we have HTML injection, and then we're going to prove that we have XSS, right? So I'm just going to go here, internal storage. So internal or external storage doesn't matter for this. It's more, it's, we can like try one payload here, one payload here. So if I hit the, on the first display, we can see we get a bigger hello. So this demonstrates that we have a HTML injection, right? Because it's getting bigger and we were using H1. And now here we have image source exoner alert one. So if I hit on display, we get the alert. So this means we have XSS, right? So now we have to keep answering the questions. So we can go here and say, okay, we have XSS, where is it running from, right? This is the next thing to answer. So I'm just going to copy this and go here. Here, now you have to go back and then go again to XSS and then this will show up again. So I'm going to paste this, right? So this is in which context is this web view being loaded? Right, so this is one thing you need to know. And then the next question is, can I steal local files, right? So can I try to get, I think if I go like this, it should work. Browser. But here, so I'm just going to paste this here. Okay, so I'm hitting display and you can see we get uh, the alert from XSS, but this is showing a uh, file URL. Okay, so this is promising because it means there's potential for stealing local files. And this is the actual stealing, right? So you can see script, then there's a new request, and then we try to get the file, data, data, OWASP, Android, goes, their preferences, user, XML, and all this, right? And then at the end, we alert the response. So if I hit display on this, we can see here my credentials, right? My username and my secret password so we could see these credentials i'm going to go back and go back again to input validations so we see again these two fields here and now if i go if i go here i can try to steal like the second right the database so that you see a little bit how this looks right so i'm going to here I'm just going to paste this. Let's see now, okay. And then maybe we can try one of the others. This data, data. This is the browser file, right? So try to read a file from another app where it has permissions. Okay, so I'm going to paste this here. And then if I display this, we can see the SQLite database. And if you pay attention, you can see my secret SQLite user is here. Then we have my secret SQLite password. Okay, so we can see the credentials right there. So you can see that the data that I wrote as I created the files has been saved, right? And this is uh, the one from external storage, right? So we're trying to read, in this case, a binary file that the browser application has with permissions that any other app on the phone has. So this is 
a different Android application ID, right? So if I click on display, we get the binary as well. So just to show mm. that this is not limited to the application itself, but this is also useful against any other files on the phone that the application can read. Okay, so I'm, let's skip for this one maybe 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes maybe. And then, yeah, so we have a bit of time at the end to cover other ground, right? So this one, we start more or less this slide, I think. Yeah, so from here, right? So introduction to Android code, and then this is the instructions to get the one for training. So let's give like 15 minutes or so for this one. And in the meantime, I'm going to check the chat if there's any questions. Will the recording be available on demand for everyone that registered for the course? Yes. So I'll, I will upload it and it will be available. The one that you will be able to download now is a previous recording where only two hours were available. In this case, we have four, so we can be a little bit more relaxed and cover things in more depth. But yeah, the, the recording will be up. So you will have maybe a, we'll keep both versions, the two hour version and the four hour version, but both will be there. This is, has great info, but I'm only absorbing about half right now. I would like to step through everything more slowly. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is a lot, but this is also the case in, in our courses, right? Because we want to keep everybody happy. And when you get a course, you get like, some people are like completely new and other people are more advanced and we want to, everybody to live happy, right? That they learn something. So we try to challenge the, the advanced users while at the same time, the new users also don't, leave, don't feel like left out. So we start from the basics, but we complicate things quickly. So everybody will be happy from the training, hopefully. So we got good feedback from this, but the result is the content is very dense <laughs> and some people might feel a little bit uh, challenged, but that's okay, right? Because you have uh, lifetime access to recording the slides, including uh, future improvements to, to this workshop and, and so on, right? And it's the same for well, the course, right? The course is, has a lot more content than this, but yeah, these, uh, these exercises are part of the mobile course that we have. Okay. So I'll leave you a few more minutes, right? So there's like 13 minutes left, and then we will move on to excesses and data exfiltration on iOS, and then we will see a few more cool attacks. Sounds good. No questions so far. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. The slides are visible. No questions. And now we're going to look at attacking web views and data filtration on iOS. So in this case, we have UI web views on iOS, and it's pretty much going to be the same thing, right? So uh, we can have a web view that is going to show us HTML code, right? So this code then will the web view could have like JavaScript enabled and all this, right? So in this case, we will use the vulnerable insecure app and we go to web view issues and start challenge. And this will be the place where we, right? So here we type like hello, and then we can see like some text in there. And if we try the hello with one tags, we will see, see that the hello gets bigger here. And then we can try same thing, right? We can try to alert one, we can try to alert location and see in what kind of context this is being rendered and with what kind of permissions, right? And then we can try to read like local files from the phone, right? So we can try to get data usage, SQLite or something like this, right? So in this case, we have script and then we have uh, XML HTTP request and then the server usage uh, DB, right? So the first thing we do when we do the alert one, we can see that the about is saying null, so there's no URL. So this is the equivalent of a file URL on Android, right? So this means there's not going to be any uh, same origin policy limitations. And here we can see we, that we have like Apple Web Data. So Apple Web Data is again equivalent of, of a file URL on Android, right? So it means that we can read local files and we can send them to an attacker, right? So 
With this, we can do some XSS like this, and we can read some SQLite databases and stuff. So this is what uh, that looked like. But we're pretty much answering the same questions and doing the same thing, right? So we do image source location of one, uh, alert location. Then we can see we have Apple web data, right? So this is not protected. We can read like local files, data usage, cellular usage, and stuff like this from the phone. And then to find this in a code review, right? You would look for WK web view and UI web view, right? So UI web view on iOS is kind of the old way of implementing the web view. So these are uh, pretty much insecure by default because you have like JavaScript enabled, file access is not disabled. So if you don't have like any URL set up, so in this case, uh, you can see that the affected file, so is this uh, Swift file here, it's a UI web view. It is not the new and safer WK web view. So this means by default, it is going to be vulnerable. It is going to have like JavaScript enabled. And if there's no URL, it will allow us to exfiltrate uh, local files using XSS. So that is that. And then uh, this is how the vulnerability looks like. So it's web view, load HTML string. And then we have here a string concatenation in Swift, right? which is something maybe some of you are wondering about. How does a string concatenation look like in Swift? So this is how right so so yeah this is the name parameter and we have hello name so this is the string concatenation and because it's being used as a load html string this is what results the access right if you use xcode this is how it would look like right so you would click relevant swift file and here you would look for string concatenation so in swift is this like back, backward slash and then backslash and then in parentheses you have the name and then the other critical point here is that the base url is nil right so this is what allows us to do the data exfiltration because there's no url the web view is being loaded uh, in a privileged way so any xss can be used to steal local files from the phone and send them to an attacker right so here you have this is what i explained before so ui web view is kind of the old way it has like all the insecure settings enabled by default and the wk web view is the new way kind of new web view way of doing things it is safer it has the settings by default are more secure and i think it also is faster so for performance reasons it's also a preferred option but still ui web views are still possible even in swift so always look look out for that right so if it is a ui web view if it says the base url to nil this means there's potential for data filtration right so with that let's go to practice so this is an iphone that i'm using right and i'm going to open the vulnerable and secure app and in this case we want to go to web view issues and i start challenge and then what i need to do is is with me anymore this so in here we can check all these things right so i can copy these maybe i can copy a few don't remember so i go here and then i'm going to paste all the payloads here and now we get all the alerts at once right so we have the about null right so this is saying apple web data so this means it's a privileged way for the xss to execute right we also have here id now we have the alert one here we can verify that we can read the sqlite database successfully right so this is all proving all this data exfiltration and stuff on ios right so if you want, I'll give you like 10 minutes for this, and then we have like half an hour to try to cover as much of other cool attacks as possible. Sounds good. Any questions about this? So this is pretty much uh, how data exfiltration works on iOS. Let me check the chat. No questions in the chat. Okay, so let's leave five, 10 minutes for this one, and then we move on to continue with other demos and stuff. Okay, any questions so far? If not, I think we can move on.
which it seems there's no question. So let's continue because we have a few more cool attacks to cover. So now we're going to look at more clear text HTTP attacks on iOS. Can anybody see the vulnerability here? There's an application that requests and caches a CSS file from the server. And then subsequent request will check only if the file has been modified. And then the server will always reply with not modified. And then the CSS file is added uh, into every article and rendered like this, right? So this is the code for the actual thing, right? So we have some HTML here and this is the style. And then, yeah, we have the server provided the CSS here. So does anybody see a problem with that? Any takers? Nobody? 10 more seconds. Okay, so this was a very cool attack, right? Because since the CSS file is being requested using clear text HTTP, right? You can see it here. And then we can modify the CSS file uh, so that it closes the style. You can see there's some style text here, and then this is the string concatenation. So we can, and then here is the server provided CSS, right? So we can close the style insert or script tag right and then point to an attacker control css file which is really not a css file but a javascript file right so we have permanent xss uh, against the application right so the xss payload will be executed every time the user reads an article even when the attacker no longer has money in the middle right so this is a pretty cool attack it's like a permanent xss of the user right so we can a lot of inferences, right? So in the contents of this uh, JavaScript file, it was something like this, right? So we have like a loader file on the server, and then we're getting using JavaScript, the cookie, the location, the document title, the document body, here HTML. So we can steal everything that the user is doing. So on the server, we would get like, uh, what is the IP address, the user agent, the cookies, the URL that the user is visiting, and the HTML of the news that the user was actually reading, right? So we could get all these with this permanent XSS feature, right? So this was, this was pretty cool. And then another interesting topic here, similar to the demo and the exercise that we did before, about data exfiltration with XSS, was that uh, when an article was being favorite, it was being made a favorite, right, on the application, um, then this article would be loaded from a file URL, right? And file URL, iOS, old web view, like UI web view, this equals likely data exfiltration with XSS, right? So in here, we add like some code here so that we don't try, we kind of skip reading local files if the protocol is different than file. But otherwise, we have like a list of sensitive files and then we are going to look through those and try to get all of them and alert them and then this would be sent to an attacker, right, on a logger, right? So this is the end of the code. And this is how it looked like in practice, right? So this is how we are reading the local file. And then another thing that we could do is read local files, right? So our problem on iOS applications for these types of attacks is that there are these long GUIDs, right, that iOS uses. So you have to guess this random token, right, or GUID or UUID, right, depending on who you ask. But this is essentially a token that is difficult to guess. So sometimes in this particular application, this was part of the URL, 
So we could uh, use in JavaScript, get the token and then read all the files, right? This is the code for that. And then we have like a list of sensitive files and then we would read them, right? So this is the vulnerable application and you can see here, got the token, right? So this is the token to read all the files and then we would look through the files and retrieve them without getting the token, right? So how to fix this, right? So first of all, Avoid usage of clear text HTTP to download files. Consider pinning to make that even better against the high profile attackers. Then uh, validate the file from the server, right? So if you're expecting a CSS file, this should be a CSS file. It should not contain HTML and stuff like this, right? If possible, prior to concatenated strings, output and code, HTML characters in CSS files before merging with HTML. Avoid loading pages with untrusted input from a file protocol. Favor UI text views over UI web views where possible. Disable JavaScript if possible. If JavaScript must be enabled, consider CSP to limit JavaScript as much as possible. And then sanitize HTML prior to rendering. And for this, the some uh, good libraries, for example, don't purify, will turn into any like user supplied HTML into safer. HTML, right? So it's a good library for that. Now let's look at more data filtration attacks. In this case, we have browsing functionality, right? So there's an exported activity with browsing functionality, right? So we have an application. It has some functionality that expects other apps to send uh, URLs to it, right? So we have a browser basically. Uh, so another app can send it a URL and then the app will open this URL to the user, right? So this is the what the exported activity looked like. You can see it is implicitly exported because there's an intent filter here, right? So this is the implicit way of exporting an activity. Explicit would be that you have here like exported the true, right? On the activity tag. And here we can see this on the intent filter. So this is the intent extra processing. We have a new intent. String URL, intent, get intent extra of search query, right? So intents can have parameters. In this case, it's called the query. So it's getting uh, the query like this, right? Uh, and then after all this, does anybody see the vulnerability here? Let's give this one 10 more seconds. Any guesses? Nobody sees a problem with that. This is how the URL is being validated, right? Do you see a problem here? Nobody? Okay, so the problem is that this allows file URLs, right? So we can use this to make the app, since the app is a browser and it will open the, whatever URL we send to it, we can send it a file URL and then we, to the SD card, since this is a malicious application uh, scenario, so the malicious application has access to the SD card and it can send it a file URL, right? So how this looks in practice is like this, right? So we have a still HTML file on the SD card, and then we send an intent to the victim app, right, with the string intent extra. It expects this query and the URL with the file, right? And then we start vulnerable application. So what this is going to do is it's going to navigate to this HTML file which contains these contents, right? So then all these sensitive files would be like retrieved and then sent to an external file, right? So this is how it looked like in practice. So yeah, we have again another way of getting access with data exfiltration. So how to fix this? Uh, do not accept file URLs. Uh, disable set allow file access. Disable set allow file access from file URLs. Some of these settings are now defaulting to false in more recent Android versions. But still, developers could enable this, and then you you're back to square one, right? You could have this problem or setting that you should disable. Let's talk about now uh, an iOS chat application. 
So this is an attack with permanent XSS with data exfiltration again. So the application was output encoding HTML correctly. If this HTML was coming directly from, from the user you're talking to in the chat application, but the user could send you a, a message like this, right? Like, can you copy paste this message into the chat? It seems something's not working. Thank you. And then you put like some script tag there. And then this was not being saved, right? So whenever this was copy pasted into the chat, then the user would self access basically. And then you would have like permanent access. So again, you can like look through sensitive files and then all the data. This is how it looked like. Yeah. And how to fix this? Output encode user input on all locations, the URL, the chat input sent to others, the chat input sent to self, the database, and uh, better to be saved than sorry, right? Now let's look at XT crypto attacks, right? So we have a crypt messenger Android app. Does anybody see a problem with this? Any any takers? The app receives encrypted files, right? File is received the encrypted, and then when it is being decrypted, a new file is created with the original file name provided by the sender, right? So this is dangerous because if this is not being sanitized correctly, this can lead to problems, right? But the problem is right here. We have a, a sender provided file name, and then when this is created, this can result in problems, right? What problems? So they can give you an original file name like this, right? And then you can like dot dot slash your way out of the intended directory and you can overwrite arbitrary files on the phone, right? So the user A encrypts a message with an original file name like this. And then when user B receives and decrypts this file, this will result in creating and overwriting any file in the app storage, right? Now, uh, I'm going to show now another one for a PHP uh, email app. Uh, it, was, it was on iOS and it was using JavaScript like this. Now, I'm going to skip a little bit the questions because we're a little bit short on time. It's almost pretty much 10 minutes left. So let's try to cover as much as possible from what remains. So what's the problem here, right? The problem is we have string concatenation. We have the var message. So this was doing PGP doing with uh, JavaScript, right? So it was doing all the private and public key kind of management uh, using JavaScript. So the actual vulnerability is here. Um, it is set in the message and then it's concatenating the message with the string concatenated for JavaScript. So it seems safe, but uh, it's, it was actually not, right? So if you would send somebody an email like this, Right, like single quote and then semicolon and then this JavaScript payload and then something at the end so that the entire JavaScript is valid. You would have something like this, right? So private key, passphrase, and then you have the message and this is where the injection happened, right? Because it was doing all the decryption in JavaScript and the injection was here. Passphrase had already been defined so we can still, we can send a, an email like this to somebody and then when this, uh, the victim opens the email, these uh, first lines of JavaScript start executing. And here, since the passphrase has already been defined, we can steal the, the passphrase and send it to an attacker, right? And the same with the private key because it's defined here. So we could steal the private key and we could steal the passphrase from victim uh, like this just by sending a crafted email. So this was a pretty cool attack. And then to demonstrate that you can receive the files, you could have like a netcat listener and you can see that it arrives in there. So how to fix this kind of stuff? If you need to, to put like dangerous stuff into JavaScript, maybe try to base 64 encode it, right? So you would base 64 encode the entire message before a concatenation, and then encode user input in JavaScript, right? So that it's safe on that. 
Now let's talk a little bit about SmartShave. This is the application that I uh, briefly mentioned about at the beginning that was mandated in South Korea. It was for controlling uh, phone usage, installed app, blog websites, and so on. Two public Pentis reports here. So the first time we tested the application, uh, it was not using SSL at all. Everything was uh, plain text HTTP. So if you have somebody on open Wi-Fi, they can see the traffic, right? So pretty easy. So this was the first time. And then the second time, uh, because all those issues were actually reported to the vendor, right? So the next time we're trying to check if this has been fixed, right? So we can see that now this is using SSL, right? So that part looks good. But what was the actual validation? So we have an SSL error handler, right? And it says uh, on received SSL error, proceed, and host them verifier return true. So basically, this is defeating the entire SSL thing, right? So whatever invalid certificate, self-signed certificate, or anything else is going to be accepted. So this is one of the reasons why we use this app as part of our training course. So <laughs> whoever gets access to the mobile training course gets access to all these South Korea apps and the Chinese apps as well, because it has like so good to teach you about security, right? Because they have all these laws in them. We have man in the middle without warning, right? This is the main thing. So it's essentially the same as if you didn't have SSL, right? Now, another thing was a hard-coded key, right? So this was the code to encrypt and decrypt. And it's a little bit cryptic, of course, but it's basically here doing a, an XOR, right? So you can see that the encryption and decryption look the same, right? So you can use the same XOR is cool because you can use the, the same XOR key, right? To encrypt and decrypt. So you get a phone number and then they would encrypt it with a hard-coded key on the phone, which anybody could uh, decompile the phone and, and figure out, right? And it would decrypt like this, it would encrypt like this, and then the encrypted phone would decrypt like this, right? So, um, so yeah, this is kind of how this looks. And yeah, the problem is there's a hard-coded XOR key, which you can see here, right? So with a Python script, we could uh, decrypt this. And basically, since anybody can like uh, decompile the APK and see this hard-coded key, it just makes no sense to assume that it's a secret, right? That anybody can retrieve that. So this is the XOR decryption on encryption, right? Uh, in Python. So this is how this looked like, right? So this was a hard-coded XOR key on the application. This is what key looked like in ASCII, right? And Moiba is actually the company that wrote that application. So this was like the XOR key. So you have here the encrypted phone. It goes through the hard-coded XOR key and you get the real phone, right? So the real XOR key is like with these like little characters. Now, here we have the same thing, right? Uh, but instead of with the XOR key, it's using a hard-coded AES key, right? So where do we see this? Here, right? So it's getting a string value of some text defined somewhere. It's doing the base64 uh, decode of this, saving it into a string. And then here we can see that the secret key is this specific string that has just been base64 decoded, right? And this is going to be the, the AES key used for encryption. So basically, this is another hard-coded key on the application, which again, anybody could figure out by decompiling the, the application that this hard-coded key was in the phone, on the application code itself, right? And you have like the request that has, was going to be sent encrypted with AES like this, right? So we have a useless AES layer with another static key hard-coded in the application. So to summarize the catastrophe implementation, we have a phone number that is encrypted with an XOR key that is hard-coded in the application, which is completely useless because anybody can retrieve this. So it's no secret, right? So anybody can encrypt and decrypt this the same way that they do. Then this goes through a second hard-coded key using AES into the request uh, encrypted and base64 encoded. Again, this is another useless layer because the key is hard-coded in the code as well. So anybody that decompiles the code as we did would get the key. And then this encrypted request is sent over a failed SSL, right? Because I showed before that they were ignoring all the SSL validation stuff, right? So 
uh, we have two useless crypto layers, then invalid SSL implementation, pretty much uh, accepting every self-signed certificate, and then eventually this gets to the server and we get the response back, right? So this is kind of the disaster summary of this, right? So how to fix this? Validate the SSL certificate correctly consider pinning avoid hard-coded encryption keys in the apps right request over a secure connection to the server using a server public key right so for example you can use public key, key uh, cryptography correctly using the public key, key of the server to exchange a secret with the server and then the server gives you a key or something that is specific to you to your app right um, for that user specifically to do some sort of crypto, right? So this would be a proper way of using asymmetric cryptography. And then generate a key on the client and send it securely to the server, encrypting it with the server public key, right? So that would be another way. Then save the encryption key for the user safely, leveraging the Android, the Android key store, right? So that will be another step. Now let's talk about some sexy remote code execution attacks. So this was a CRM app uh, with Google authentication. So we have like a pop-up if the user is not logged in, right? And then the pop-up opens up, it opens like the Google login, and then you enter your login, your password, then the pop-up closes, it goes back to the app, uh, and then you're logged in, right? So that is the functional way to look at it, right? It was nice. What is the vulnerability here? A little bit short on time, so I'll just jump ahead. And yes, we have, SQL injection, but we also have remote code execution with this SQL injection, right? So we have whenever the pop-up closes, right? It's uh, this is kind of the deep links that we saw before, because the application is actually expecting a, a URL from Google. So this was all the after all the validation and stuff. The validation will go here, right? So we can send uh, using ADB shell or using browser or using a browser because the activity was browsable as well we can do this right so we can create a bad binary as a proof of concept right so we go into any application location and we just echo a lot of A's and save it as test.so and then give permission for all the users right so seven 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 to test.so and then we send this intent of vulnerable login web view and then we send the data uh, the actual url as vulnerable data and then this was the sql injection right where select and then load extension is trained to all this binary right and basically look at one time we would see something like this right data data just trust me test.so has bad magic and this was the vulnerable sql query update threads set out key and then we close the single quote and then we're load extension data data just trust me test right so doing this we have a sql injection using a deep link right so this is a deep link as well because you can see here a deep link using a deep link we have sql injection and at the same time code execution because we can supply like any library that we want now another cool twist to this attack is the fact that we could do this from a browser as well because the activity was browsable so we can send this attachment the binary that we want right so in this case it's just a fake binary and this uh, works on android uh, under version 6 and then so this was the like the entire page this is the payload so so we are basically doing single quote and then we're one equals select a load extension of the download file so we are triggering the download and then we are sending so first we trigger the download right and then after five seconds so hopefully after that the file has been downloaded already then is when we send the actual attack right so we get the same thing but of magic where one equals select load extension and so on now this uh, workshop would not be complete if we did not talk about api attacks so Attacking the application itself and the phone is fun, but usually you can do more damage on, on, against the API itself. So one scenario, retrieving files from the server. So I'm just going to go to the solution. So we have a path traversal with a filter bypass, right? So we have the typical string replace of dot dot slash for nothing, right? Assuming that this will be safe. But I, as I hinted about before, this is not uh, a proper solution. And then this is reading the file. So 
what can we do with this? We can provide we can provide something like this, right? So we can provide dot 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 slash slash and then like this, right? So then when dot dot slash is removed, we end up with dot dot slash, right? So uh, this is the way to bypass that, right? So this is incorrect because you can provide four dots with two slashes, and then when the slash and the two dots are removed, you end up with two dots and a slash, so you haven't done anything. And then you still have a path traversal, right? So what's a path traversal with filter bypass? How to fix it? Try to use base name to uh, get the actual file for the path, right? Try to resolve the path, so with real path, for example, in PHP, and then reject dot dot sequences. So you could look for dots and then say something like access denied, but not no like forward or backward slashes or anything like that. Just if there's two dots, just don't allow that, right? Now let's talk about uploading files to the server. So in this case, we have user file, the fingerprint, and then it was running a command. And then here we have a Python list concatenated into a CSV string. And then this was sent to a subprocess so popen with a shell true, which is an insecure option. So basically, this led to code execution, right? Because the user files are uh, derived from the PGP pre fingerprint, which end up on the process popen of running this command, the make dir and user files. So basically we have, we can provide a fingerprint that is going to result in code execution, right? So we can do URL and code of this, and then we can provide some numbers and then pipe wget, server security, who am I, whatever. And we would like, run it like this and we get code execution with the file upload. Right? So as we are uploading our PGP fingerprint, we can get code execution. And then this was the netcat listener for the reverse shell. This was the shell one liner. And then you can like send a request like this and get code execution. So this was this was that. How to fix this? Uh, if possible, avoid uh, string concatenations, avoid calling some process be open with shell equals true. This is a Python thing. And if you avoid this, then Python will auto escape arguments, right? So yeah, so if shell is false, then this will be okay. Then if you must concatenate stream PHP and other platforms offer shell scaping functions like scape shell arc, and then try to validate user input with a whitelist regular expression that is as restrictive as possible, right? So for example, only allow letters, numbers, and dots, and that should be safe enough in most cases, right? Now, I just want to show a demo before uh, we finish, if uh, we can. So this was a government-mandated app to help parents protect their children, right? Smart Sheriff, as we talked about before, but there was sister. Okay, so this was the Bully API. Basically, if you have like a bad thing class that wants to mess with other children, you could like using the, the phone number of a child as to the API and it will give you automatically the phone number of the parent. So with this alone, you can do a lot of damage, but logging as the parent on the user interface, you need a password as well, right? So bully guy, right? So this bad guy that everybody hates in class, would then ask the API like, come on, Smart Sheriff, the parent phone is cool, but give me the password too, right? And then Smart Sheriff, of course, would give you the password as well. So we had in the API response, uh, we will have the password, which was XOR with the hard-coded key that I explained before. So with that, we could like log in as the parent on the interface, right? So it was pretty bad. This is how it looked in practice. This was the universal uh, password leak. So we would get the leak, even though it's just like four digits, right? But it's still bad. So we would get, like, if you decrypt it with the XOR stuff, you get the phone number, and here you get the, the PIN of the parent, right? So this was pretty bad. Then since there are so many phone numbers, we could try them, like, at random. If, if we tried, like, random phone numbers in South Korea, we would get, like, the, the PINs of a lot of parents like this, right? And so this was uh, really messy. Now, I just want to show the smart dream. So there was a sister app of uh, Smart Sheriff, which was smart dream and this was about uh, monitoring messages sent by children right it was meant to protect the children again but in this case if they use like harmful words then it, they would get flagged and then they would be like uploaded to a server for the parents to review and stuff like that right so it uses functionality intended for text to speech 
So this is interesting, right? That we have admin or root privileges, the application could do this, but it could, right? Because it registered itself as an application to help like visually impaired people. And yeah, let me show you the demo. Can you see this? So this is the demo. Let me run it. Okay, now. So here we're running the script and it's basically checking, getting all the messages for a given child, right? So we get all the all the characters now. This was done by, by Fabian, who was my colleague working on this. And he actually replaced uh, the Korean characters by other characters. So the actual messages are not shown, even though we can't understand this, maybe some South Koreans would. So he just changed the characters randomly to protect a little bit the privacy. But the fact was like we could get all these uh, stuff from the API, right? So the API, you can do a lot of damage, right? So in this case, we could get like all the harmful messages in the API in South Korea of the children that were using this uh, smart dream app, right? So this is pretty bad. Okay, so I think that's enough. On an API, you should try to limit access to data based on user permissions, try to centralize security controls as much as you can, limit database queries based on who the user is and do it in a centralized way, and then automatically add uh, database query clauses that filter database queries on based on who the user is, right? So that would be another thing. And with that, we finished, we finished the workshop. So now you have access to this workshop forever. So you can like keep trying the exercises from home at your own pace. If you have any questions, feel free to ask and we'll be glad to help. Yeah, and this is like a small snippet about what we cover in our mobile course. So if you want to check those out, those are in store70security.com. about the workshop or do you like it? Okay, great workshop. Awesome. So yeah, if you need anything, just send an email to admin at security.com and we'll be happy to help out. Or if you know anybody who would like to access to the recording or whatever, we can send an invite to them as well. So that's fine. Awesome. So glad you liked it. Yeah, let's let's stay in touch. Uh, yeah, whatever you need, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to help you out. Thank you for coming. Have a nice weekend.